Hello and welcome to the Business Channel. Today, looking at trading with the BRIC countries. In the program, we'll be speaking to leading players, including the global trade and finance arm of RBS, Chartis Insurance, the financial services firm Law Deventure Trust, the international maritime security company Mast, and Benoy, the global design and architecture consultancy. The BRIC countries are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and they were put together, I think, as a means of drawing attention to the huge opportunities that exist in these emerging markets. For UK exporters, traditional exports will tend to have been Europe and the United States, for example, and elsewhere in the developed world. But the, the really high-growing economies of the future, rapidly growing middle classes, rapid growth rates, they tend to be the BRICS and other countries, of course, in Asia, Africa, and the Gulf, and um, elsewhere in, in South America. The scale is absolutely enormous. If you compare the small European economies and now imagine the size of the BRIC economies, there's many, many billions of people and the consumer markets there are growing incredibly, creating vast opportunities for British companies. I think they're important. I think there's a danger of getting carried away. Um, still 70% of exports are to uh, the US and, and the Eurozone. I think what's very interesting to us and our clients is the level of growth that we're seeing in, in the BRIC countries, anywhere between 20 and 40 percent. So we're really trying to position ourselves with our clients to help them to tap into some of that growth. We're present in three of the four countries with a number of branches, in fact a significant branch presence there. We are a bank to the large companies and to the banks in those countries. We also provide services to UK companies who may need local services there on the ground, as well as advisory by connecting up the groups we have in country with our teams who are present here in the UK and NetWest and RBS. The troubles there are in the Eurozone at present, more of our clients are looking towards um, markets outside the Eurozone, uh, such as the BRIC countries and many others uh, in the growth economies, as being the engines of growth for the future um, in a Eurozone that's fairly, fairly flat. So the BRIC markets are seen as the future for exporters, especially in the light of the meltdown in the Eurozone. But how big exactly is the opportunity for growth? Well, the opportunity is enormous. Uh, you can understand this if you understand the growth rates for the economies in those countries. Uh, that has ranged really from 4% up to 11% uh, between Brazil and China um, in 2010. Uh, the growth rates in the UK, in Western Europe, and in North America are more on the range of 1% to 2%. So the growth itself is actually fueling the need to trade internationally and both the imports and exports in those countries have also grown dramatically since we came out of the recession in 2009. I think if you look at the world economy now, you will see that the, many of the developed markets are on a slow growth trajectory as they recover from the recession. They, they return to growth, but that will be relatively modest for the next few years, whereas the emerging economies didn't really suffer the world um, recession to anything like the same extent as the developed world. And uh, those that saw a small dip in many cases, they, they returned to these very rapid growth rates. So I, I think that the changes are very, very significant indeed. Well, I think we're expecting to see the amount of growth in those markets to, to grow considerably. Um, we are already now starting to see many companies who are exploring those markets for the first time. I've been going to Brazil for probably the last 15 years, and we've seen now a, a, a dramatic change in that market. We're certainly starting to see the, the growth of the middle class, and they are starting to become a, a consumer nation. So again, in, in all these markets, all the big countries now, we're seeing you know, far more interest in, in Western goods. So there will be tremendous opportunities, I think, there for, for, for European companies going forward. I think the scope is just immense. We now enjoy over 80% of our company's income from overseas. And I think it's a growing opportunity. I think you need to put people on the ground locally, develop local strategies, and work in close conjunction with your British base to ensure that you get the best of both international and local expertise applied to all the developments. I would say there will be more cross-border trade in the future because I can see that the Chinese government is promoting that they would like to have more investments overseas and at the same time they encourage investment into China. 
I think also in China there's an increasing emphasis on value added and high tech production and again the excellent reputation of UK companies I think will be part of that development. I think also UK companies will be mindful of the continuing strength of the renminbi and will have an interest in acquiring renminbi denominated assets as a hold into the future. But the BRIC countries aren't static and what we're selling and to whom is changing all the time. Our experts have noticed patterns of trade changing and also particular sectors seeing more growth than others. Uh, the patterns of trade are changing already. We have seen some good signs. For example, uh, exports to China and to Brazil are actually outpacing imports from those markets. Uh, the exports to India, though, are also growing. So this is already a good development in terms of UK companies taking initiative and actually delivering on their objectives to fuel their own growth. Yeah, I think to date we've seen largely uh, the energy companies, the oil and gas companies and infrastructure companies. The really big projects have been most of the areas where we've seen involvement in the BRIC territories. But as the middle class grows in those countries, I think we're seeing um, many more suppliers, many more UK companies who are wanting to trade into those territories. So. That growth, I think, is coming much more in the middle market SME corporate area. Well, we've already seen signs of an increase in volume. The volume comes not only from the increase in, in trading between UK companies and the BRIC countries themselves, but also trade between the BRIC countries and the BRIC countries and the other emerging markets, especially those in the Middle East and Africa and in Latin America outside of Brazil. So what we are expecting is growth among our existing customers in country as well as an expansion by countries, by companies here in the UK uh, and elsewhere uh, into those particular markets. An increase in trade means an increase in security is needed, especially when products are exported by sea. The international maritime security company MAST sees particular opportunities for growth where it operates in the Indian Ocean with 22,000 ships passing through that region every year um, and I think only 20% at the moment approximately taking armed security um, there's a great deal of potential growth and I, and I think just in, in, in many respects energy security uh, is becoming more and more important and it's obviously trade passes by the sea and it's, it's an, un, an uncertain environment so I think that there's a great deal of scope for security companies and for us to grow. It's become self-evident that since 2005 the problem has, has grown exponentially. Um, for a number of reasons, the uh, instability in Somalia continues, um, the lack of a political solution and uh, simply the commercial realities of, of, of for the Somalians is this is a business. So all those factors um, alongside the, the fact that the Indian Ocean, the Gulf of Aden are extraordinarily large areas all go together to create uh, you know, this, this extremely uh, almost an intractable problem um, for the shipping community. Now you mentioned the Indian Ocean and you do deal with the BRIC countries. Is sort of India and China, do they need your services a lot? Well I mean the trade routes historically from east to west um, have to pass through uh, that area. Um, of course they can go south around the Cape but the, you know, the Suez Canal and the movement of oil and goods east to west um, mean that you know, those countries are absolutely vital uh, for our daily lives in the west. And so we have a lot of clients and a great deal of interest in, in, in that region. All kinds of insurance and protection are essential for companies trying to minimise their risks. And there are many different types of products on the market to help with this. But certainly there is a real pressure on banks in Western Europe to de-risk and de-leverage. Um, so this is impacting their ability or willingness to, to lend to uh, companies and exporters into those markets. And again, the banks themselves are looking at um, you know, 
not doing anything new. It's very much you know, back to basics. So when they're looking to export into some new markets, often those, those banks decide not to, uh, to support those, uh, those exporters. By bringing in credit insurance, you know, we, we are very used to taking risks in those markets. We have a lot of local people on the ground. We have a lot of experience. So we're very comfortable in insuring those risks. What we are seeing is our ability to insure those risks certainly will help the, the client um, make greater of their receivables eligible for, for funding going forward. So again, they can increase the amount of funding that they have available. Again, this is absolutely critical when they're being forced to offer extended payment terms into those BRIC countries. They, they need that finance to keep their working capital there. One particular insurance product that has developed um, basically as a result of the Somalian uh, hijacking problem has been um, specific uh, kidnap and ransom insurance. It's, it's obviously historically kidnap and ransom insurance has been in existence for businessmen and other people, you know, high net worth individuals being kidnapped. But obviously now with ships being taken, um, ship owners want a specific product that they're able to draw upon in the event of, of a hijack. And historically, insurance used to cover that amongst many other elements, and I won't get too technical on it, but I, I think it's, it, it's very evident that security plays a part in that because the underwriter wants to know that if he's giving that insurance to the ship owner, is the ship owner taking all precautions? And obviously, if you put an armed security team on board, um, history has shown that it's 100% successful. So, of course, for an underwriter, that's a very important fact. We expect to see companies covering you know, all their non-payment risks. So, again, we cover uh, default due to insolvency, also what we call projected default. So this is an extended period of time where you'll, no matter how much you've chased the buyer, you're unable to get payment. So typically this would be either between 120 and 180 days uh, waiting period. We'd also expect them to, to cover the political risk into those markets. Again, these are very evolving markets. So again, looking at covering uh, export and import, import embargo when you've got uh, specific customized goods, uh, looking at covering um, exchange moratorium. So this is again where there's no foreign exchange in that country to pay the debts as well. So again, these are some of the um, political events and also things like confiscation. So where you're holding a stock or goods in that market, having those confiscated by the, the local government as well. Protecting investments can also include setting up escrow accounts to ensure bills are paid as agreed. The corporate trust company Law Debenture Trust specialises in providing M&A based trust services within China. An escrow arrangement is where two parties to a transaction have agreed that part of the money due on the transaction will be withheld until a particular condition is satisfied. But obviously the question arises who is going to hold that money pending disbursement and particularly if the parties haven't dealt with each other before they would probably prefer an independent trusted third party to look after the money until instructed to release the funds in accordance with the terms of the agreement. In the case of a straightforward acquisition, escrows are used um, perhaps if there is a warranty on tax or something which has to be satisfied and then the remainder of the consideration is held by us pending release. It might be in the case of a joint venture where we can put together some special share trust arrangements to provide protection against insolvency. It could be an employee share trust to keep incentivized key members of the team. There's a whole range of uh, services that can be provided to solve practical or possibly regulatory problems. So what are the challenges and pitfalls when dealing with the BRIC countries? Chartist Insurance covers trade credit risks amongst other eventualities and says there are many hurdles to get over when dealing in the BRIC markets. I think it's the high degree of reg regulation in the BRIC territories, um, particularly in the insurance area. Um, Non-admitted cover is not permitted in those territories, which means basically you have to buy cover locally uh, and a lot of the risk and the premium has to be retained locally. Now that's certainly a big issue for our major corporate clients who want to self-insure a lot of their own risks and they're effectively forced to leave those risks in territory. 
Um, so it's something that we have to work with them in terms of uh, the work that our chartist businesses in each territory can do to try to maximise the amount of premium that they can uh, exit the country. Trading with those countries is more complex than it is when you're trading with Western Europe or domestically because you have foreign exchange considerations to bear in mind. There also are other kinds of issues in terms of the way business is done locally, in terms of understanding the culture, in terms of understanding what kind of financial structures need to be put in place because of foreign exchange restrictions and other uh, ways of doing business there. If you look about back five, ten years ago, most of the trade to BRIC countries was done on letters of credit. Uh, but in today's environment, um, you have much more competition and buyers really now in those markets are demanding open account terms. So to win a deal, you have to be able to offer you know, significant uh, open account terms. And for many buyers in those markets, their cost of funding is quite high. So if they can get you know, cheap supplier credit, then that is a huge bonus for them. But that creates a lot of potential risk for exporters into those markets. Um, although now there's certainly much better financial information available in, in all the BRIC countries, um, it's really important to understand the client's willingness to pay as well as, as, well as its ability to pay. And I think that's, that's really important um, because in many of these countries, the legal infrastructure, although it's, the laws are there, um, it's sometimes very difficult to enforce uh, payment through the courts. It can take a very long time, or in many cases, it just can become a, a, a real problem for, for you to establish that, uh, that debt. Um, and a good, good example, in, in China, in many cases, we had a, had a case fairly recently where to take a, an action on a, a multi-million pound debt from a Chinese company, the court was requiring our client to put down a 20% deposit on the amount claimed. So again, that's a huge barrier for them to be able to take legal action against that particular buyer. Um, another big problem that we often find is that they, they may not be trading with who they think they are. So although they, they have the, the, the company's name and title, sometimes that company may not exist uh, legally, or sometimes it actually it has associated companies which maybe it has transferred its assets to. So in fact, it's just a shell company that you're trading with. So again, these are some of the problems that you're faced with the company. And that's why it's so important if you are going to be trading those markets, you really need to have local presence, understand who you're dealing with, and really trying to form partnerships where you know, mutually uh, it's beneficial for both parties. Well, the credit risks in the BRIC countries are really uh, no different than the credit risks anywhere else. Uh, except for the addition of those foreign exchange regulations and the fact that some of the markets are not free markets in a sense that you don't have the ability to forecast a change in exchange rates in a China uh, or in an India because those governments are controlling the rates and they may suddenly wish to shift the rates to serve their own uh, eco economic management purposes. It is difficult to do business in the BRIC countries. I think uh, many of the businesses in the UK have found that. Uh, but I think it can be done. Uh, I think there are smaller firms, I heard of a, a lock manufacturer who had recently uh, opened up in China and had quite a successful joint venture going there. And I know in India as well, there have been many successful um, ventures um, in the um, biotechnology and venture capital fields. Brazil is a, is a huge attraction. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity there and I just hope that uh, British industry seizes it. Local commitment is key when dealing with China and the BRIC countries. Some companies prefer to open their own office on the ground and others partner with a local existing firm. I think the, the solution really um, is to make sure that you have uh, the right partners in place that can help you locally. And certainly from a charter standpoint that's where we feel we have a real differentiator because the businesses that we have on the ground in each of those territories, in fact across the globe, um, are uh, large businesses in their own right that can help our clients, both from an insurance standpoint and also from a general business partnership standpoint. And something that we're very keen on promoting is that the senior management of our operations uh, within charters in the BRIC territories do have a relationship with uh, the local businesses that we're seeking to support. So it's not just about insurance, it's about general business advice and partnership. I think the important things that companies should understand is that they have to put a lot of time in to become uh, successful in Asia or any of the BRIC economies. You cannot do it from afar. You cannot sit in London 
and assume that the work is going to come to you. You've got to engage. And in our own case, over the last 10 years, we've now established many offices throughout the regions in the uh, growing economies in Shanghai, Beijing, Abu Dhabi, Mumbai, Singapore. All of these uh, offices are fully engaging with the local emerging economies. But you wouldn't say you have to open a local office because you haven't in Brazil. No, not at all. You don't have to open an office. You can create partnerships with local providers of service. And in our case, we will be doing that initially in Brazil in advance of opening our own standalone office. It's particularly important to have a local business with local claims uh, personnel in place to handhold our clients through the claims process, which can be very different to the process that's followed um, in the more developed economies. So again, we put great store by having that expertise in territory um, and ensure that the communication lines between that resource and ourselves and our client in the UK is pretty constant. All businesses face challenges, but these can be doubled when dealing with different cultures and protocols. Advice from those who've done it before, do your homework. One warning I would give is that you're going to a country that operates very differently at many different levels. So no matter how experienced you are in your home market, don't assume that you can behave in just the same way in China. I would strongly suggest that um, UK companies going to China receive the appropriate professional advice locally and that way I would hope and expect that they will avoid making what might be costly mistakes. I think there can be many ways in which things can go wrong. Um, a, a very common mistake is companies almost leaving their brains behind when they first go out to China. Um, they, they see a huge opportunity and they jump in with two feet and don't do the due diligence that they would do anywhere else in the world. So that is possibly the most common mistake, it is sort of rushing in um, before really checking out things as you would elsewhere. People often ask if it's very different exporting to the emerging markets and the answer is there are, there are some differences. Uh, I mean obviously there may be cultural differences and UKTI can help with those. It may be more difficult to get contacts to know who to speak to and again UKTI can help. Um, the distances are greater, there are a huge number of regional cities for example in China and India that companies need to penetrate and again it's really important that they, they get help. So we take large numbers of missions for example to these, these, these high growth markets. We, we really are there to help companies in every possible way. I think it's vastly important that companies who are expanding into the BRIC economies do their research, work out what the opportunities are develop an, a strategy for the scale of opportunity. We, in many cases, uh, develop local relationships, partnerships with local companies to take advantage of these situations. The opportunities are vast for, for, for companies to enjoy those uh, economies, but I think it's important that they focus and understand what they've got to offer themselves. They've got to be sure that their own business is best in class. They've got to develop a strong brand and then develop a, a strong research into the new markets before delving in. Well the first advice I'd like to give is that one has to be in constant contact with, with your banker and that would really be before you've signed your contract, during the negotiation process again and again just prior to the finalization of any kind of contract because you want to make sure you have the right financial structure that will give the best benefit for you and for your customer that will help you make that sale. You also want to make sure that any of the costs that you might be expected to incur would already be built into your analysis of your cost and the price you're able to get from the customer so that you can protect your profit margin. My advice to companies considering the brick markets is absolutely, first of all, yes, they should consider them. No company can afford to ignore these rapidly growing markets. And the second advice I would give is use UKTI services. We have staff in 96 markets around the world. Uh, many of them are locally engaged staff. They really know the market. Uh, use our services. Businesses aren't going it alone in breaking into these markets. Companies and government agencies are helping out. We've been spending a lot of time taking leading uh, politicians, leading ministers to different countries, so Brazil, China, India and so on. 
And that's a crucial part of what we think is important the government can do, which is to lead those delegations, particularly in countries where if the government uh, it has a good relationship with us, then our businesses will have a good relationship with theirs. And that's where I think there's some great opportunities. So I've been very encouraged, and you only have to see our contribution, for example, to Airbus, who in turn have sold substantial numbers of aircraft, India, China, to see the opportunities that we have. The bank has been very active in driving the exporting agenda with government, with the UKTI, for example, uh, with the other uh, entities like the EEF, and also with the Institute of Export, in terms of enabling companies to take advantage of export opportunities as a strategy for growth. Uh, this collaboration has been in the form of driving new programs the government can offer UK exporters, like the bond support scheme or the working capital scheme and the uh, export enterprise finance guarantee, all three available to UK companies uh, for helping them with working capital financing and, and credit provision by other banks. We also at CBBC work very closely with UK trade and investment and deliver their portfolio of services for British companies in China. Um, so the type of ways in which we can help companies is we can do market research, we can identify partners, um, we can arrange visit programs for companies, and that can be either on a solo basis or we also can um, work with other organisations to arrange trade missions, so group visits to multiple cities in China. And a very large part of the work that we're doing at the moment is to get companies to understand the opportunities in regional cities across China. What one of the most amazing facts is, it has almost 300 cities with a population of more than 1 million people. And yet, if you went out onto the street out here, you probably find that people could only name maybe two or three cities. And this is one of the things that we've got to change in the UK. We've got to get more business people knowing that there are these very vibrant cities um, across the whole of China where great opportunities exist. And this means people getting off the beaten track and getting their backsides on planes. We've known the slogan by British for a long time now, and now the rest of the world seems to have caught on to the idea. I think I'd be talking about skills. Uh, I'd be talking about the areas of comparative advantage in this country, that this country uh, still has to offer. We clearly can't promote ourselves as a low wage centre, uh, and alas, we can't present ourselves as a low tax centre. There are fields, intellectual property dominated, where Britain does still have a lead over many of our competitors. I think we're in exceptionally good position, Britain, at the moment. We're in a good time zone. Our, our currency is competitive and I think Britain is extremely competitive now. Our labour laws and so on make us very attractive to uh, foreign companies to come and engage with British companies. Oh, I think we have the creativity, we have the technology and we're a highly competitive country and we very much have always been a trading nation and that combination makes us a world beater. So Britain is on a high trading with the BRIC countries as British know-how, expertise, products and services are in demand if the right guidance and approach is taken. Well that's all we've got time for now but if you'd like to find out more about any of the organisations that we featured in this programme then look at our website thebusinesschannel.tv. Bye bye for now. <laughs>